You may be seated. What an amazing name, Jesus. What an amazing God. At this juncture, news of the Lord Jesus has spread to all the surrounding regions of Israel and beyond, even to the, the Gentile regions that we saw, Decapolis and Tyre and Sidon and, and all, all around the region of, of Israel. And his popular, popularity has drawn the attention of everyone from the common man, just the everyday person, the everyday Joe like us, just the common man, and, and also the who's who in Israel, the, the powerful men of Israel, the religious leaders. Everyone is formulating some sort of idea of who this Jesus really is, this Jesus who comes from Nazareth. There, there are those who think his ministry is legit, that he's from the Lord. There are those who... who think that, yeah, he's, he's a good guy, he's from the Lord, and they, but they're not sure exactly who he is. And then there's those who say, he's an imposter. He's not real. He's not legit. But even amongst his own men, they're formulating ideas of who he is. I mean, they're walking with him, they're talking with him, they're seeing him do an amazing work. They're hearing these amazing teachings. And yet they're still kind of determined who exactly is Jesus and, and how is he going to have what kind of role is he going to have in Israel? I mean, the religious leaders, they've, they've been challenging him relentlessly in every which way. And they've determined already. They've already come to a determination of who Jesus is to them. I mean, we were told in Mark 3, and it also says in Mark 12, it tells us that they've already kind of determined that he was an imposter, they're not going to believe, and they want to kill him. And they're plotting to destroy him. And in these passages today, Jesus will address both of these issues. Who he is and how that reality will play out to his death and his resurrection. But not only will Jesus reveal himself in this glorious, incredible way, but God the Father will clear his son's identity, his importance. It's a powerful, this has to be one of my favorite passages of Scripture. So let's dive in to Mark chapter 8, where we left off in verse 27. Now, Jesus and his disciples, they went out to the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? So they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and cried to him, You are the Christ. In verse 30, then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. So here we have Jesus and his men. Uh, they're leaving Bethsaida, which is on the extreme north end of the Sea of Galilee, and they're heading approximately 25 miles north uh, into Upper Galilee, into an area known as Caesarea Philippi, which is right at the base of Mount Hermon. Now, this was kind of like a, a little mini retreat, if you will, kind of gathering these guys together and kind of pulling away from the multitudes and the crowds. And there'll be a crowd we'll see later, but he's kind of pulling away and taking this opportunity to really address one of the most crucial questions that, that needs to be asked, not just in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, but the outermost parts of the world, even today. To get some alone time, he begins to dialogue with them kind of stirring conversation amongst them and says, who do men say that I am? Who do men say that I am, guys? I mean, what have you heard, Bartholomew? What, 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 Judas, what says you? Right? Who, who am I? What, what is the men? Who are the men saying that I am? This is the buzz. What was going around? Well, I'm sure they, they talked around the fire when Jesus wasn't around. And then they, they kind of, well, he's got to be this. He must be this. And the scripture says this. And, and man, you know, I was talking to a butcher, and he was saying this. And, and so Jesus is saying, who do men say that I am? And 
And they answered. God bless that children worker back there. <laughs> Praying for you. <laughs> Who do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. So, so back in chapter 6, we read where Herod taught uh, Herod believed this and kind of shared this. Mark brought it to light. If you can remember, he believed that Jesus uh, was uh, John the Baptist. That's who he said. Oh, I believe he's John the Baptist. He's, he's raised from the dead is what we remember him saying back in, in chapter 6. But, but Jesus, yeah, I could get this in one regard. Jesus, like John, uh, very authoritative in his teaching, when he said that when he would teach, they'd be like, whoa, this, is, this guy's different. It's very authoritative when he taught. But, but, but he ministered in a different light. I mean, Elijah and John probably more, more, more alike. You know, Elijah did these amazing, miraculous things that people can compare him to, you know. You could, you could see the two and how they were authoritative with the people. Uh, they, they came and they did great miracles, but, but they were different. John and John the Baptist uh, and, and Elijah, they came with this ministry of judgment, dealing with people, dealing with the leadership, calling them out, calling them to the carpet. I mean, John the Baptist did the same thing, and he kind of lost his head over it, Right? And so they were really similar. But Jesus, he comes differently. He comes in the spirit of meekness. He comes in the spirit of service. And it's also kind of confusing because Jesus and John the Baptist ministered at the same time. So that would have probably cleared some of the confusion there. But somehow people still said that and they taught that. But maybe by seeing Jesus as John the Baptist or even Elijah, people hoped for a political messiah who would come and overthrow the corrupt Roman powers who were oppressing Israel. So, okay, so, so they're saying maybe John the Baptist, it's possibly Elijah, that's who they're saying that you are, or one of the other prophets. Matthew includes Jeremiah. Matthew's account throws Jeremiah into the mix here. The weeping prophet, okay? Jesus was a man well acquainted with sorrows, all right? But, but let's move on to the real question. Okay, you've told me now that, that this is what the men say that I am. They say I'm this. They say I'm that. That's great. That's, that's, that's interesting, okay? But, okay, guys, rein it in. Rein it in, guys. Pull, pull it together. They're walking down the road. This is what they're doing on the way to Caesarea Philippi. Hey, I can just see them stopping and saying, guys, it's interesting. What do you say I am? Who do you say that I am. I mean, isn't this the real question? I mean, at the end of the day, at the end of our physical life, this really is the most important question, the only question. I mean, we have a lot of questions we have to answer. Who, who I'm going to marry, that's an important well, You know, what career field I'm going to take, right? Am I going to go to college or go to the career field? We're playing life the other night, and they made it so easy, you know? Spin the little wheel. I think I'll have children. I think I won't. I think I'll have three. I think I'll, I'm going to choose. I think, I, you know, it, you know but, but those are important questions. Am I going to buy a house or am I going to rent? I'm going to move to this region or that? Those are, those are great questions. They're important questions. But it really isn't the main question. You see, everybody has to make this decision at some point in their life. Who do we think Jesus is? And that matters. Maybe you've said as Peter, and I hope you have, that you are the Christ, is how Peter answered. You are the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah, the Savior. And Peter, Peter knew what the crowd thought. Though they... They believed good things about Jesus. Yeah, you know, he's a good guy. He teaches good things. He does good things. They were wrong. People who just think Jesus is a good guy, they're, they're plain and simply wrong. He was so much more than a national reformer, more than a miracle worker, more than a prophet. Jesus is the Christ, 
the Messiah. Now, now in Jesus' day, this would have been such a radical, radical thought. Because most of the people believed that the Messiah would be, again, this political, national superman. Not this meek, miracle-working teacher. He doesn't fit the bill to what they wanted. He fits the bill what the scripture said would come, but not exactly what they wanted. And this would have been a radical thought. In Matthew's account, Jesus gives Peter uh, a compliment for this answer. In Matthew's account, when he, when he says this, God kind of pats him on the back, so to speak. Jesus kind of says, hey, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Right you are. Right? They I mean, kind of letting him know that it wasn't his own. This was a divine revelation. And let me just also submit to everyone who comes to this place and has to answer that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, it is a divine answer. There's something going on as the Spirit of God goes and begins to come alongside of a man, begins to woo him, draw him. We all have scales of sorts that need to be dropped. We all have things that we are hanging on to, clinging to, that at some point we have to say, hey, I surrender. I can't. And it, it, it's this reckoning. It's this, it's this agreement that I come to with God that says, hey, I cannot. I'll receive now. Because I cannot. I'll receive now your salvation. Forgive me, God. This reckon, recognizing, this agreement, this confession. It's so divine in nature as God begins to deal with each one. He may be dealing with you today. Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And, and, and you're going, oh, he's, no, he's bugging me with this, right? And now the pastor's talking about it. Can't I go to a church where they don't talk about Jesus? Well, there's lots of them out there. But we're, you know, this is something that we, but we do, you know? And the whole, it's not me. It's the Holy Spirit that's working on you. And maybe you're walking with the Lord and you're kind of, you're not where you should be. And it's the Lord. He convicts you and draws you to him because he loves you so immensely. It's a divine thing. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this, but our God in heaven has. And then he, he tells the man, hey, not to, not to share anything, not to share with anyone about the, at this juncture. Don't, don't talk about it. This is our little, this is our secret for this season, okay? I'm going to expound about, uh, upon this a little bit later at the very end of our, our message because he'll say it again. Not to share it. It's always perplexing for us. To understand. Why not, you know? Well, you know, let me just say that sometimes we have our own little secrets that God has with us, and he'll direct us to reveal them in, in, uh, in, in, in due time. But now, upon this, this incredible, glorious revelation, Jesus goes on to reveal not only his true identity, but his purpose, his mission. And this is as radical as saying that this meek, mild teacher is the Messiah, is what he's about to say. We read in 31 that he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by elders and chief priests and scribes and, and even killed. And after three days rise again, we're told in verse 32 that and he spoke this word openly. So when Jesus connects the Messiahship was suffering and death here. He was making statements that were, to his disciples, both incredible and, and probably incomprehensible. I mean, their entire life, they have, as good Jewish boys, have been taught about the Messiah, that he would be this conquering king, this conquering general, this conquering ruler. And now they were being presented with this idea which was quite contrary to that. But they were all focusing on parts of the Scripture that they wanted and liked. Isn't that true? Because that Jesus was to be a conquering general and leader, 
It's true. There are passages, lots and lots of passages that talk about him coming back. We see it in Revelation 19. It was given to the church. Him coming back and being this conquering general on a white steed, right? We like that. It's, it's powerful. It's real. It's rich. It was prophesied. And they were clinging to those messianic passages in Scripture. But they were only gravitating to the ones that they, that they liked, that made them feel good. I mean, we do the same thing. Um, I was talking with a friend this morning before church how we often take passages of Scripture and we pull out what we want. Jeremiah 29. Isn't that one you get on every card? You know? I know, you know, it works out for you are good and not evil. And I've got to, you know, we, and it's always a, a little snippet from that, that text from Jeremiah that we kind of grab hold of. Uh, granted, the, the, the promises in Christ Jesus Promises to Abraham are yes and amen to those who are in Christ Jesus. I get, I get we can glean from, but the context is pretty rough if you read that passage. I mean, it says that, yeah, I'm going to finish my punishment with you, basically. Um, you're in punishment because you sinned, and now I'm going to bring you through punishment, and when punishment's done, you know, then I'm going to restore you. That's the context. We wouldn't like that part on a card, right? Let God finish the punishment with you. Right? And then he's got a good plan for you. Right? We, we kind of gravitate to those texts that we want, that are, but, but the reality is, the, the, the reality is, we got to take the whole of God's word, context, right? Isaiah 53 teaches what Jesus is sharing concerning the Messiah, that they didn't want to, they, they loved Isaiah, right? They read from it frequently, but yet they, they didn't quite want to, to recognize and reconcile this passage and Isaiah 53 beginning in verse 3, to indicate this is a suffering servant, Messiah. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces for him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Oh, no, that's got to mean something else, right? They could not swallow that. It was hard for them to. To swallow that Jesus' death was this absolute. And as David Guzik writes, the suffering and death of Jesus must, or, uh, Jesus was a must because of two great facts man's sin and God's love. While his death was the ultimate example of man's sin against God, it was also the supreme expression of God's love to man. Wow. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. This will make a major impact on Peter. You'll see him reflected in his writings later. But Peter, at the time, he doesn't like this responsibility. He doesn't like this, this first mention of the Messiah. Ah, We read in verse 32b here where I left off, it says that he spoke, words openly, and then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And again, th- this was this, this, this radical statement to, to fathom, contrary to what he and his, his men had been taught and brought up their whole lives. And you notice it was as if they, they didn't even hear the second part of Jesus' statement. You know? Right? And after three days, I'll rise again. That's key. You know, you, you think you wouldn't leave that off out of your mind, your processing and, and thinking, you know? I mean, that would be like, that would be like me telling the Pats fans, hey, the Falcons are going to whip your your behind you all up and down the field for three quarters into the, the fourth quarter. And then you're walking off, you know, Bobby crying on his, his jersey, his Pat's jersey. What? What? Are you crazy? They're going to be so far behind, it's going to be impossible. For them. No football team in the history has ever come back, right? But then you're not here in my second part. Then your team's, your team's going to come back strong and in overtime win, right? You would almost, you think you'd forget about the first three quarters that you would be crying over, right? And you would go right to the fourth and realize, well, these guys just kind of lost it. They, you're going to die? Wait a minute, we've, been, we've, we've left all to follow you, and now you're, gonna, you're just going to die? 
You're gonna, you're, wait, hold on, you're gonna, you're gonna, be, you're gonna die? Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And after three days, I'll rise again. It's like they, they can't seem to get that in their brain. And Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. I, mean, I think Peter means well. His intent is good, I'm sure. He was out of love for Jesus. He loved Jesus. But he was being used by Satan. This is one to really talk about in your connect groups. Think about this. We, we don't have to be demon-possessed for Satan to use us. We always need to be on our guard. Satan hates God's plan for us. He hates God's plans for us. He hates God's plans in godly relationships. He hates godly relationships. That's why there's so much strife and stuff that's sown and people trying to separate and divide. And, and that's why there's such a heavy barrage and attack, especially on marriages, on godly marriages. It's a God design. He created marriage. Men wouldn't design that. <laughs> He, he designed it. It's beautiful and brilliant when it's, when it's honoring God and you're trusting the Lord and he's in the very center of it. But Satan, he's a, he's a master of psychology. He knows what buttons to push. And although he can't enter us believers, because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Right? He's not sharing a room with Satan. The Holy Spirit's not. Hey, keep it down over there. No, he's not doing that. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. He can't enter us, but he can persuade us, and I, and I believe bait us into feeling, in feeling certain ways, or responding a certain way in his favor. That's why my, my heart breaks when I see marriages dissolving because of he says, she says stuff. He said that, and he doesn't really feel like the way he should be feeling towards me. She's not doing what she's supposed to do. And there's this like, he baits them, he baits us into reacting certain ways in marriages that are really petty in the scheme of the long haul. And we end up buying into because of pride. Because of pride, we end up buying into his baiting, resenting then. Right? And we lose the battle and we lose the war instead of just losing the battle and winning the war. It's over minutia, typically, is the way it starts. Don't, don't let him, church. Take, take the higher ground. This is what God has been dealing with me for years and years in my relationships. And I've had some good ones, and I've had some really bad ones. And I don't just mean marriage. I've only had one marriage. but Yeah, I've had, you know, 19 years I've been married, 15 blissful years. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> she said 11. No. <laughs> right? Take the higher ground, right? Die to yourself. No, but I can't. I'm right. She's wrong. Who cares? Be wrong. Be patient. This, by the way, is Satan's kryptonite. What's the kryptonite? Dying. Dying to self. Dying, by the way, is how, how Jesus will be a reigning, conquering conqueror over sin, over death, on the cross. He dies. He doesn't take up a sword. He doesn't say, I'm right. I don't think I'm going to call those that legion of angels down, right? Because he could have. He didn't. He died. Died to himself. You know, you, if you just bow down and worship me, you could have all the kingdoms of the earth. Satan tempted him once. And he said, get behind me, huh? I'm going to die. But Jesus had to respond accordingly. Dying was that important. Get behind me, Satan, he tells Peter. And just a, a, a moment before, Peter has this divine revelation. There's this messenger of God. He's then a, a spokesman and a messenger for Satan. Isn't that interesting? Jesus knew that there was a satanic purpose in discouraging him from his ministry on the cross. No, no, Jesus. There's another way. Jesus wouldn't concede. I wouldn't say it's a death wish. I think that if there's any other way, he would have taken it. He even asked in the garden, is there any other, please, is there any other cup I can drink? Not this cup, it's a Randy paraphrase version, but Take it from me. If there's any other ways, what, what, the, what the heart is conveying in that text. 
man, but he had to do it. He had to concede. And with the message of this personal dying on the table, Jesus moves and kind of quickly goes to address the qualifications for those who would follow him. And guys, this is a rough text. I'm going to give you a, a warning about it, okay? This isn't, a, this isn't a, the text that most Christians like. It's, this isn't one you'll see on a billboard. This is, this is one that's pretty, it's pretty tough. I'm just going to give you a, a warning for it. It's in, we begin in 8, verse 34, that when he called the people to himself, along with his disciples, he said to them, okay, here you go, guys. Gather, people, you've been following me? You're with me? Okay, all right. You guys, disciples, you're around? All right, I got your attention. Let, let, me, let me share something with you. Okay. And whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Whew. You know, look at the time, right? I mean, not, there's a kind of a hardcore description that he gives of a Christian. And quite frankly, it's, it's not, it's really not that appealing to, let's say, anyone, right? But he opens the door to everyone. Did you notice that? Not appealing to probably anyone, but available to everyone. Whoever desires. Whoever desires to come after me. So no one is excluded. But likewise, no one finds himself, no one finds himself accidentally accidentally following Jesus, are misled to think that Christianity uh, is this bed of roses. I mean, right from the get-go, before the church is even established, he's saying, hey, if you want to follow me, um, take up your cross, deny yourself, uh, and follow me. There's no confusion. I, mean, I, I, I love the truths of God's word, the promises of God's word. I, I, love, I love the encouragement that I find in God's word. Because they're rich, and, and, they, and I hang on to them in those tough times. But the reality of it is, tough times do happen. Bad times do come upon us because we are living in a fallen world. And as a Christian, there is going to be a battle. Men, men are going to not like you when you stand up for the truth. So often I, I hear altar calls that are appealing to man's emotions, the emotions of man. Man, you will have rest. Jesus said, come to me if you need, you know, I'll give you rest. You'll have peace. We'll have blessings and so on and so on. And all these things are true. They're true. We will. But not until we first come to a place of self-awareness that we're sinners and in need of saving and die to our old self-reliance, our own self-achievements, denying self and taking up our cross. Whew. Not a popular message. Not something, again, you'd see on billboards. And Jesus makes denying self equal with taking up his cross. The, the two express the same idea. The, the cross, we look at it, it's, it's a piece of jewelry. We look at it, it's kind of something you'd put on a church. It's kind of like, but really, it was kind of a vicious thing. It was a brutal thing in that time. It was something that when someone was carrying a cross, you were like, mm-hmm, they're dying. They're going to die. That's what they're doing. They, there's not going to be a stay of execution. The governor's not going to come in and go, oh, you're pardoned. Nope. They're on the way to death. There's no way out. And they're carrying it. <laughs> there's no hope, no help at that point. Self-denial, or denying self, rather, and taking up the cross. The cross wasn't about self-promotion or self-affirmation. The person carrying that cross, they knew that they just absolutely could not save themselves. And denying self means to live a 
as an others-centered person, not merely self-denial, not just self-denial. We do that a lot. I've trained for a Spartan race where I'd, I, had to, I had to watch what I was eating, right? I had to, I think I won't have that six glazed donut, right? You know, I had to watch what, what I was eating, you know, because I was self-denial because, you know, I was doing this or I was, uh, you know, I was, I've even fasted in that regard where I was fasting for someone, you know, but it was really self-denial for myself <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. We do it for good causes, but usually it involves self-promotion, self-gratification. We get something out of it. In the end, I can step on the scale and say, yeah, look what I denied myself. Ten pounds lighter, baby. All right, all right? Some way or another, it's not dying to yourself as to die and, and lean on, on Jesus for the purpose of, of salvation that Jesus has already earned for us and now we're walking in it, recognizing it. Lord, help me. Because he goes on to say, to take up your, the other component is that we would, we would die, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and then follow him. You, you know, when I find myself close to the Lord's heels, when I find myself really close to him, drawing near, I'm denying myself, uh, I'm, I'm drawing close to him uh, because I get to, because he, he has brought me into this loving relationship. I love it when my son follows me around, and I've got three, and they're all so different, and one of them will follow me around and want to help me do things. The other's kind of wised up to it, and I don't think so. I'm not following Jesus. I'm not following, you know, daddy today, right? Uh, he's doing yard work, huh? Wait, I'll follow him to the beach. Um, but, but this one follows me around. He'll help me. He wants to help. He wants to help me do things. And I thought, how beautiful it is that when I, when I follow Jesus closely, when I'm closely on his heels, I find myself going where he is, doing what he does, uh, concerned for the things that he's concerned about. But I also may suffer for it too. Sometimes Jesus comes to bring a sword. I have to, have to die to my own ambitions my own thoughts, my own reputation, so to speak, for the sake of Jesus. One day, this is going to be a word that's very applicable. Now we live in a country where it's okay. You, you can follow Jesus. You can wear Jesus T-shirts. You can put Jesus bumper stickers on your car. You can even stand on street corners and tell people they're going to burn in hell if they don't know Jesus, right? We live in a place where you can... Do, but not, it's not so around the world. We have uh, Voices of the Martyrs, someone we support monthly, and, and we have um, calendars back there. You can grab one. They're free calendars. And, and then for every day, there's a different country you can pray for. They're being persecuted for their faith. It's a heavy reality. Those guys have to deny their own ambitions to follow Jesus. And they're losing their life because of it. Jesus goes on to share one of the most mysterious conundrums concerning spiritual life in Christ. He says in verse 35, that for whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him, the Son of Man, will also be ashamed of when he comes in glory, the glory of his Father, with the holy angels. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. So, Whoever tries to hang on to his life, they're hanging on to it, they're going to lose it. This life which was born into sin carries with it all the pain, all the suffering that's attached to this fallen world. And with it, the wages of sin, which is death. But Jesus says that whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospel's save it. And Jesus gave his life a ransom for us. So we exchange this life of sin for his life. 
Oh, when we're saved, we're not saved because we do this. We're saved because Jesus died on the cross. By grace through faith, we're saved, but we, we take up his life and we enter into this rest, certainly, peace, certainly. But eternal life, the gift of God is eternal life. What a deal that we exchange this sinful life for the life in Christ. It's a beautiful thing, is it not? In the midst of the storm, we can know our Savior. I was at the hospital bed of a, of a friend. She's a dear woman. This is on Thursday, and she's, she's, uh, she's really ill. And she may pass away. And, um, but she had such joy in the midst of a storm. She laughed. She was wanting to redecorate the room. Because hospital rooms, ugh. You know, she was like, this needs to be here. And, you know, I just couldn't help but laugh, you know. And she's, she, she knows what's going on. She loves Jesus. And there's such joy. There's such, she's exchanged this life of sin, this life of death, and she's, she's given it over, and she's got this eternal life in Christ that started many, many moons ago for her. But what a deal. Jesus is saying, why buy stock that you know is going to be worthless? Although it, it looks appealing now, seems right, feels right. The purchase price is cheap. Everybody's buying it. This is the stock. It's going to pass away, and one day it's going to be worthless, and you'll lose everything. Some people put all their stock in this world, into this life, to the physical things they're in. That's what Jesus is saying. The disciples, one day... It's going to get tough. Don't cater to this sinful generation. Don't cater to this world. Those who deny me will one day be denied themselves. But the same, I believe, will will be true for those of us who aren't ashamed of him, who choose to follow him, to stand for him, stand for the gospel. We'll be accepted. Isn't that going to be an amazing day for him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And, And I'm going to go... Really? Because I can see a life of blunders here. Ah, oh, but, you, but you, you chose me. You followed me. You trusted me. You gave up the pursuit of the things of the world for joy and for happiness and for peace and for rest. And you came to me. Well done, good and faithful servant. Man, he's going to accept us because of what Jesus did. And we won't regret it the years that we invested in the kingdom of heaven, the years we invested in the gospel and in Jesus and our lives and our families. Ah, what a beautiful day one day. Jesus then gives this short-term, right-around-the-corner prophecy, really six days literally, gives this prophecy to his men, um, which I'm sure kind of got the wheels turning. You know, some are standing here, guys. I got your attention now, talking about death and following me. Uh, okay, uh, some are standing here who won't taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. I mean, walking with Jesus doesn't just mean a life of death and crosses. I was at a connect group the other night, me and friend Bob, we were talking, uh, talking about how, you know, you can get these beat down messages at church. And they can just beat you down, beat you down, beat you down. When, when every day you come to church and you hear the cross... And every day you hear this beat down message, you know, you, you leave kind of going, whoa. But, but the reality to this is that you can't just take the first part without the second. Just like the suffering servant must suffer and die so he could raise again and live in glory, right? Well, you, you, you deny yourself, but there is such life that's gained when you do that. As a Christian, we have such a joy. Uh, this notion that I had when I was a kid that when I got saved that I would have eternal life, you know, when I died, Right, that's when it kicks in, like social security or something, kind of kicking in at the end. That's not it at all. But because, and we don't depend on that these days, you know. But like, when you when you give your life to Christ, you say, "Yes, I want to follow you, Jesus. You are the Christ. You're the Messiah." Eternal life kicks in immediately. Isn't that a beautiful reality? The, the, that we were reading, we were studying through the book of Ephesians together. We were talking about the depths of God's riches for us and how we don't even realize who we are in Christ until we begin to grow in Him and realize the benefits therein. 
this life of power and glory of the kingdom of God. These disciples, I mean, you'll see three of them will get chosen to see this amazing power and glory in Christ. God will reveal himself to you guys individually in such beautiful ways that no world, no TV show could ever depict adequately as you follow him. Here, let's check it out, how he reveals himself. He, now, in verse 2, six, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes began, became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth could whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them, and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. So, so Jesus, he, he singles out Peter, John, and James. He's like, come on, guys. I want you guys to come with me. The rest of you guys, stay put down here. And he took them on a high mountain. Most likely it was Mount Hermon because it was uh, located at the, the foot, uh, Caesarea Philippi, where they were heading, where they were at. It was at the foot of Mount uh, of Mount. Herman, so it was one of the foothills, perhaps, of Mount Hermon that they kind of went up onto. Uh, and so they make their way up into this high spot on the mountain, and Jesus kind of stops. And the next thing you know, you know they, they, they see him transfigured before them. His raiment, his clothes, his outer, outer cloak, most likely, it shines so bright that the Clorox tide could not, like, could not whiten it, Right? And while they were standing there in, the, in this transfigured state, Moses and Elijah, they appear, they appear there. They're talking with Jesus, you know. They're talking there. And these guys are they're watching. The disciples are watching this going on. Like, uh, Moses and Elijah. Why were these men with him, people ask. They speculate. Many people speculate uh, that, that this is representing those who would be caught up to God. Jude 9 and 2 Kings 2.11. That Moses represents those who would die and then go to glory, most of us. And then Elijah represented those who are caught up to heaven without death. As 1 Thessalonians 4.13 depicts, which we know as, as the rapture. Others, others say that Moses and Elijah are there with Jesus because they represent the law and the prophets. Moses kind of was used to bring in the law. Elijah was used as figuratively as representing the, the prophets. That Jesus came to not do away with, but to fulfill the law and the prophets. And now he's, he's with them, kind of reconciling them, uh, really talking about death. I mean, to be a fly on the wall to hear what was going on. But, but um, they were talking with Jesus. I mean, Luke 9 tells us in verse 31, 931 of Luke, that they were speaking about his coming death. So, but to hear, with their, was there small talk going on? Was there, hey, Elijah, how's Elisha, you know? Uh, Moses, you know, seen Sarah lately? You know, I mean, was there small talk or was it just all business? And I don't know, but, but this heavy, heavy sense going on, as Luke says, and fitting, very fitting that he's talking about his death to come. But I don't know if you guys have thought about this, um, just as a side note, that some 1,400 years before Moses passed away on the border of the promised land, he was not allowed in the promised land. You remember that? He misrepresented God. He lost his life before he could go in. Joshua took the people uh, the rest of the way. And now he couldn't enter into it. But now he's sitting in style, glorified with the Son of God, the Messiah. And how cool is this, right? And it seems that Peter, he's kind of on a roll lately. He, he doesn't know what to do. He says, uh, let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Uh, and when, when Peter saw Jesus in his glory, it, some suggest, some suggest that, that he's thinking to himself, uh, this is good, uh, this is how it should be. Forget this business about suffering and being rejected and crucified. Hey, let's build some tabernacles here, man. Let's move on, this glorified Jesus. At this time, this is it. I kind of think it's more simple and innocent than that because of the scripture kind of depicts because he did not know what to say. Like, he's standing there and he's like me, 
You know, he's just got to say something, and, and it's, not always, it's not always a good thing. I mean, I remember I was working at Mount Asia Golf on Pensacola Beach. I was in high school, and, um, and I, I didn't know how to work this register, and, 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 I, and I, was, I was nervous. It's so nervous. I didn't know how to work it, and, and, I, and I was kind of shy to be around people I didn't know kind of thing, and I was like, ah. And, and I remember this very, very large lady comes to the counter, and, uh, and I was nervous, and I, I didn't know what to say, and I said, so when's the baby due? And it did, I released it like a flock of doves just kind of out of my mouth, and I, I couldn't get it back. I just could, and by looking at her face, I wish I could get every thing, I, you know, and, and it, was, it was awful, right? It was terrible. I just didn't know what to say. Right, so it's best to just not say anything. And he, he does. He, he says, let's make three tabernacles, right? And not the answer. So we read in verse 7 that a cloud came immediately. It says, a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came in out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And suddenly, when they had looked around, they saw no one but only Jesus with themselves. And now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one and the things that they had seen till the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And so this cloud kind of comes and surrounds them. It's the same cloud, really, it's been associated with both this reverence of God and this sweetness of God's presence through which God ministered to Moses, he ministered to Solomon, Elijah, and and Isaiah, and his vision in the Old Testament. It overshadowed Mary, as we saw in the Christmas time, during her miraculous conception. And we'll receive Jesus up in glory after the resurrection, this cloud. And out of this cloud, this voice said, this is my beloved son, hear him. I really do not think there could be a clearer message from God to this. Saints and prophets of old, they, 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 they were used to great capacity. Men of God, leaders, leaders of God are wonderful to have. Godly traditions of men are nice to have. But let me, let me get your attention, he says. My son Jesus is the most important, hear him. And the very reality of that only Jesus was left there with them. What a great reality it is. It's Jesus alone. And we should follow, hear, trust from day to day as well as our eternity. And then he commanded them to say nothing. And why would he do this? You know, I believe because God is perfect. His timing is perfect. He knows the heart of man He knows the hardness of their hearts. His own men had a hard time believing that he was to suffer, die, and rise again. So the surrounded people, how would they embrace this mountaintop experience? And I said earlier, I'll say again, some experiences are for us alone to share, only when God wants us to share, right? It's a beautiful reality. There'll be a time where he says, share it, but this isn't the time. In the very last passage we read, before we close the day, is, and they asked him, saying, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And then he answered and told them, indeed, Elijah is coming first to restore all things. And as it's written concerning the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it was written of him. And Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of God, got the disciples wondering here. If Jesus, if you are the Messiah, what happened to Elijah? Doesn't Malachi 3 say that that Elijah must come? Jesus, this forerunner must come? And Jesus was answering in, in terms that the Jews would understand. Elijah, he said, has come. And the people treated him poorly. They took him. They arbitrarily applied their will to his life, forgetting God's will. Who cares what God wants? And he was referring to the imprisonment and the death of John the Baptist. We remember at the hands of Herod. And then by implication, he drove them back to the main point, the main thought at hand, that they had to face this reality that was determined upon him, Jesus. If they've done this to the forerunner, 
They'll do it to the Messiah. Right? So, powerful passage of Scripture today that brings about the question that each one of us ask, who is Jesus? When the Pharisees, King Herod, the multitudes, the disciples, you and I, everybody must decide who Jesus is. Is he a great prophet of old? Is he a good man that did good things, taught good teachings, inspires us to do the same thing? Or is he the Son of God, the Christ, God himself, who came to bear our sins on the cross? So while we, we live and we breathe, we have the moment to decide. But then after this moment, we, we, there's no guarantee. And if you haven't decided to follow Jesus, this is the time to do it, guys. It's not rocket science. You simply say, Jesus, I, I believe that you are the Christ. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And you rose again. Forgive me for my sins. Forgive me, Lord God. It's all you have to say. So today we're going to close our time together uh, with a, a brief time, but an important time to come to the table and remember the Lord in believers' communion.